Good evening, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Petr Chalupa. I'm with Oracle Labs, and uh, I work on a project called JRuby Plus Truffle there. Let me first just make sure that you understand that JRuby Plus Truffle is just a research project at Oracle Labs. It has nothing to do with uh, Oracle products. And any opinions expressed in this talk are my own. So let me start by introducing uh, two projects, which will touch in this uh, presentation. The first one is called uh, Concurrent Ruby. It's a basically uh, an unopinionated uh, collection of high-level and low-level concurrent abstractions. And unopinionated means that we are not trying to force uh, any solution on you. You can choose the best solution which works for your particular problem. We support MRI, JRuby, Ruby News, and we are also working on support for JRuby plus for right now. And uh, this gem is already used in Rails 5, Sucker Punch, Dynflow, and many more projects. And we've just released uh, uh, 1.0 version, so it's a great milestone for us. <laughs> From the high level abstractions, uh, we have, for example, Chainable Futures, uh, Go Inspired Channels, Actors, uh, Closure Inspired uh, Agents, Software Transactional Memory, and more. We have uh, atomic references, that safe data structures, and some low-level uh, synchronization primitives like countdown ledge, semaphore, cyclic barrier, and stuff like that, which allows you to uh, create uh, another uh, concurrent abstractions more easily. And the second project, which was already mentioned, is JRuby plus Truffle, which is an experimental backend in a JRuby and it's part of the same uh, repository. Uh, so it's open source. It's basically an AST interpreter, but uh, with the key thing that it's a self-optimizing uh, abstract syntax interpreter, which means that as uh, it, this interpreter executes your code, it can profile which branches were taken or what types it saw. And based on that, the nodes can specialize and after some time, this uh, tree of nodes, we can assume that it's stable and we can feed it to a Graal compiler. It can then pr produce highly optimized uh, machine core for us. If some of these optimal assumptions fail, then we can invalidate uh, the compiled core which was relying on those assumptions. Go back to the interpreter at that point, let, let it run off some more, specialize again, and again compile. So this is basically the gist of it, why JLB plus Truffle is quite fast, and we will see some of the results. Uh, we support the, the, the JRuby plus Truffle supports whole Ruby without any restrictions. We also support the tricky ones like debugging setrace function and object space. We also, you don't also need any options to turn them on. They are always on, and then they don't have any overhead if you are not using them. We are at about 90% compatibility, based on Ruby specs. And as I mentioned, it's part of the same repository as JRuby. So it's also part of the distribution already. So if you add uh, option X plus T, you can already try some micro benchmarks or very small projects. Um, and we already run some of the gems which are listed at the bottom. So now let's move to the main topic of this talk, which is implementing a concurrent abstraction. So let me start talking a little bit about why concurrency is actually difficult. So the main reason is that processors and compilers are free to reorder in which your code is actually executed. As long as, long as they keep sequential consistency and you don't tell the compiler that you don't want some pieces to be reordered. And you may think that it would be good to just, just to prohibit this behavior, but actually this is very desirable because compiler and processor may do lots of optimizations due to these reorderings. So you cannot just forbid it. But the result is that uh, another thread may see very strange values because on a thread A, the code is actually executed in a different order than you wrote it. So thread B sees the uh, writes to the memory in a different order. So to be able actually to reason somehow about this, we have to consider all the possible variable, uh, sorry, all the possible valid orders uh, in which your code can be executed. And to be able to construct 
these orders, we have to have some kind of framework to be able to figure, figure them out, which is called memory model, and I will touch, I will talk about that a little bit later. And of course, this has a greater impact on JRuby because, uh, sorry, on JRuby plus Truffle, because JRuby plus Truffle is able to optimize your Ruby code into much less uh, uh, instructions, so you can actually observe these uh, effects of reordering more often. So let me show you some example of what can happen. So this example, we have a simple class with just one field value. And we will be assigning a new instance of this class to the local variable. So we have here two writes to the memory. This is the first one. And here is the second one. So and uh, we are reading them both here on the line 17. So if compiler tries to optimize this, it can see that it doesn't matter in which order these two writes are executed, so it can actually switch them. But if that happens in this thread, you can actually observe that, you, the, in, that the, the instance was already filled, but the value, value wasn't because the order was switched, so this can actually raise an exception. So now let's move to the actual implementation. For this talk, I picked a simple uh, abstraction called future, which is actually just a reference of some computation which was not done yet. It, is, it has a very simple API. You can create new future. You can fulfill it with some value, uh, or you can pick the value up with the value method, which can be blocking if the future was not fulfilled yet, or you can check if the future was uh, completed or not, which is non-blocking operation. So let's look at uh, some example how uh, this can be useful. So with future, we can build uh, this simple background processing. At the top, there is just a simple helper which uh, prints time as outputs. And here, we have simple background processing. Uh, we do it by creating one shared queue for the jobs. And then we have two workers here, which is basically just two threads which are in a loop uh, popping up pairs of job and future from the worker queue. Then it computes the result and fulfills the future with the result. And at the end, it just prints out uh, some time to result when it was computed. So with that, we can uh, create this simple async helper, which allows you to execute uh, Ruby block uh, of blocks of code. Uh, in a synchronous manner. So this method will be returning immediately. It will be returning a future instance. So you can then query the future and a call value which actually blocks your thread until the job was computed. So then we can create an uh, array of five jobs here which will just multiply the index by two. So this calls returns immediately five jobs. This, will, uh, this is just to check that the array actually contains the futures. And in the end, this will block until all of the values are computed. So we can quickly run it. And you can see that it takes some time to compute because I put sleep here just to slow it down. At the end, it prints all of the results. So now I can look at uh, first simple implementation of future. So for the first one, we use uh, just tools which are already present in a standard library of Ruby. So we use mutex and condition variable, where mutex is just basically a non-entrant lock. And condition variable allows you to block threads until some condition is met. In our case, it will be until the future is fulfilled. And we also use uh, instance variable to store uh, the current value of the future. And the lock gives you basically two things. The first one is the critical section, which is uh, which you can create with a synchronized uh, method here. And this uh, basically ensures that only one thread can enter into this uh, block of code. And it has also another property that when uh, one thread makes some changes in this section, another thread entering the same section always sees all the changes made by the first thread. 
So with that, we can implement the first feature. Uh, let's start with the complete method. We first read the current value. We have to protect it with the synchronize. And we can compare if it's pending or not. Uh, in the value implementation, we have to use, again, the critical section to make this atomic, because we have to make sure that we are going, uh, we are going to block the thread here, putting it to sleep only when the future is not completed. So if the future is completed here, we just return the value. Otherwise, we continue here and the thread will be blocked until it's woken up here by the broadcast method on the condition, on the same condition in the fulfill implementation. So that's the reason why you need these critical sections here. So now let's look how this performs uh, on the different implementations. Uh, the scale is in seconds and it's uh, 5 million operations for each of the micro benchmarks, complete value, and 2.5 million operations for the fulfill part, which is trying to simulate that usually you are trying, you are reading the value uh, more often than fulfilling it, which is just fulfilling it once. So now let's uh, think about how we could uh, improve uh, the performance of this. So we'll start by looking at uh, MRI implementation. And the first observation is that synchronization is actually expensive going through the critical section. So we will try to ev avoid it. And for that, we use that we use the fact that uh, MRI has GVL, global VM lock. And if you look into the, into the source code, uh, you, you can find that there is a CMutex in uh, GVL release and GVL acquire. The CMutex has same, pro same properties as the Ruby mutex I was just talking about. So then this basically means that when one thread uh, releases the uh, GVL and another acquires it, the another thread sees always all the changes made by the first thread. So this, the effect, the, this implies that uh, MRI instance variables are effectively volatile in a Java sense. And volatile means that uh, if you write a variable, uh, volatile vari to, to a volatile variable, uh, all the readers will immediately see the current value. If you read from a volatile variable, you cannot get a stale or some old cached value. Uh, and I have to warn you that this is undocumented behavior, actually. Even though many of the Ruby code and libraries are depending on it intentionally or unintentionally. So let's look uh, at the specific implementation for MRI GVL. So it's pretty similar. We, again, need uh, mutex and condition variable. But uh, here in the complete implementation, we now don't have to protect reading from this uh, instance variable because we know that this is a volatile read, which means that I always get a most up-to-date value. So I can just read the value, compare it with pending, and that's it. And in the value implementation, we can actually, uh, again, uh, sorry, in the value implementation, we can avoid uh, going through the synchronized block by just checking first if the value was complete or not. And if it is, we return immediately. If the, f if the future is not fulfilled, we'll still have to go through the slow path. We have to recheck again because the future could be completed just between this check and going here into the critical section. So we have to uh, re uh, recheck the status if, it, if the future is complete. And the fulfill method is uh, same. You may ask why this check was not moved out in the same way as uh, in the value method. It's because this is actually an exceptional path, which means that if you move it out, all of the uh, correct call calls to fulfill would pay the price that it would be checked twice. OK, so now we can look at the performance improvement. And as you see, the value microbench bar and complete are much, uh, much better. So, let's look at what we could do for JRuby, JRuby plus Truffle, and Ruby News. For JRuby 
plus truffle, we will use Rubinius implementation because JRuby plus truffle also implements some of the Rubinius APIs, so it will work on it too. So on these three implementation instance variables are not, not volatile. And also method calls are not protected in any way, including initialize. So this actually means that if you remember the sim first simple mutex feature implementation, uh, the constructor was actually not correct. Because if you, again, remember the first example of reordering I showed you, that you can observe object, instance of object with initialized, uninitialized instance variable, you can, uh, it, you can get it here. So for that we need to, need to somehow fix it. And we can do it with final instance variables, which is a variable which we will, by convention, only assign once in a initializer. And then we uh, somehow ensure that it's always after the new instance is published and shared with other threads, that it cannot happen that the other threads will see initialized variables, final variables. So let's move to the example. So we start with the Rubinius implementation. Again, we need a lock and condition for the slope pass and uh, to store the value because as we talked about, the value actually is not a volatile variable. So we uh, here use atomic reference which basically holds just one variable with volatile semantic, semantics. So we will use that. And to protect these variables from being seen uninitialized by other threads, we insert full memory barrier here which tells uh, compilers and processors not to reorder anything from down to up or in, in, uh, from up to down. So now, after we are sure that this is never seen initialized, we can look at the rest of the implementation. The complete method, we just read with volatile semantics the value, which is done with the get method. The rest is the same. And in the value implementation, it's again the same algorithm. We just first check if the value is already set or not. If it is, we return immediately. Otherwise, we go through the critical section and we will block the thread here until it's woken up by this broadcast here. In JRuby implementation, it's, it has the same form. We just have to switch the Rubinius uh, specific parts for uh, JRuby specific parts. So for storing the value, we will use atomic reference from Java Util concurrent uh, atomic package. And to uh, insert a full memory barrier, we will use uh, full fence from a JRuby class, uh, which does the same. We will not be using uh, mutex and condition variable here because uh, Java objects has these utilities uh, on themselves, so we can use through JRuby these methods. So we will switch, in, instead of having here a lock and going synchronize on it, we will use the actual uh, Java object representing this future, which you can get with this reference method. And we will use uh, wait here to block the thread if the future was not fulfilled. And we will use notify all to wake up all the waiting threads in the value method. So now we can look at uh, how this performs. As you can see, the, this implement, the specific implementations improved for all of the Ruby implementations. For JRuby plus Truffle, this looks pretty good, I think. And, uh, but, uh, sorry. But now we have a problem that we have three different implementations. And this is quite error prone. Imagine doing that for all of the abstractions in concurrent Ruby, right? It's not really maintainable. So to solve this problem, uh, we need some kind of layer which uh, can uh, solve these uh, problems for you and you can create your abstraction just once against this layer and it will work for all of the implementations. So for that, we need memory model and memory, memory model extensions. So memory model is uh, basically the framework which allows you to reason about the, your program, how it behaves in concurrent environment, and about all the possible orders it can be executed in. So we've constructed to, to still the command in progress, but it helped us to reason about our abstractions in concurrent to be able to make them correct. Uh, and the way how this is constructed is that uh, 
we've took behavior of all the Ruby implementations and combined it to together, together. So for example, if uh, one, uh, one implementation has volatile variables and another doesn't have volatile variables, then uh, we say in the memory model that they are not volatile because then we can make sure with other, ex uh, with other extensions that the, that the code we wrote against this model will work on all of the implementations. And one of the things this memory model defines is, for example, if the uh, variables are atomic, volatile, or if they have serial, serial, serializability. So, uh, as you can see, the instance variables are only uh, atomic and serializable. So, uh, this still doesn't solve the issue with uh, the initialization. You could you still have that pro problem. So for that, uh, we have uh, some extensions in uh, concurrent Ruby. And there is a concurrent synchronization object, which provides uh, three methods. The first one is a class method, safe initialization, which just marks the class and all of its children to have safe initialization, which allows you to construct the final field. Final field there. Uh, then there is also attribute volatile allows you, which creates for you a volatile reader and writer to some instance uh, uh, variable. It doesn't, it cannot actually mo modify the behavior, the semantics of instance variables. So you have to use these writers and readers. And also there is uh, attribute atomic, which uh, besides the volatile reader and writer, it also creates uh, some atomic uh, methods like compare and set and uh, swap, and uh, I'll be talking about them later a little bit more. So this is implemented by providing a different implementations for each of the uh, Ruby runtimes or different versions. So this is quite flexible that we write our abstractions once and we can then evolve this layer uh, for for new versions, for example, if some of the implementation decides to support uh, volatile variables uh, natively, we can just reuse that and drop our Java extensions or whatever we have uh, in the implementation from the given platform. So now we can look at uh, the example of how we can write against this layer. So we have the another implementation and we start by uh, inheriting from the object, from the concurrent synchronization namespace. And we mark it that we, we need uh, safe initialization so we can be sure that these two variables are visible of, uh, when this new instance of this class is shared. And we also need uh, one volatile field to, st to store the current value and we need to be volatile, so here we always read the most current value. The rest of it is pretty much the same as before. Again, we return early if the future was already completed. Otherwise, we go to the critical section and we block here the thread until it's completed. And the fulfill part, again, is the same. We just have to use the writer here, which was created for us by the attribute writer method. But uh, now let's look how this performs because it's important that uh, if we have this abstraction that it performs pretty much the same. It has some down, it's not all the same for the JRuby Plaster is very good because JRuby Plaster is able to optimize away all the abstractions provided by this layer. For Ruby News, the value when complete is good. There is some issue with the fulfill part. JRuby is good on MRI. There is a little bit of overhead because MRI doesn't do uh, method inlining, so we actually do more, more method calls here. So it has slight, slight overhead, but I still think that it's worth it. Now we can uh, improve the final part we left there, which is the fulfill method, which still always goes uh, through the critical section. So for that, for that, we will need the atomic, uh, attribute atomic uh, method, which creates uh, the volatile reader and writer, but also uh, some of the atomic operations like compare and set, 
compare and set and uh, swap. And the first one, uh, basically you have to uh, supply what you think that the value is. And if it still matches the current value if that in that field, it will be swapped, uh, it will be set to the new value. And you get out a Boolean if it was actually set or not. So the way how this works usually is that you construct uh, a loop where you first read uh, the current value from a field, then you compute a new value, and then you try to set it with this operation, atomic operation compare and set at the end. And if, if it succeeds, you break from the loop. If it fails, you repeat. And if there is a contention, like three threads are trying to do the same thing, then the, one of them succeeds, and the rest of the threads uh, repeat until they succeed too. So these are essential to uh, building log free abstractions. And we can use this to get rid of the last critical section in the fulfill uh, method. So let's look at it. Ah. So this is slightly more complicated. And the trick is that instead of having a single condition variable where we would uh, uh, block all the threads, we will construct a list of threads which, is, which are blocked on, uh, on, on this future. And uh, to represent that, we have this node which uh, holds the thread it represents. And uh, it also has a flag to confirm, to confirm that the thread was woken up successfully. In the future class, we again need safe initialization. We need atomic, atomic, uh, attribute atomic to store the current value and also to store the head of the list. So in the initialize method, we, we set heads to nil because there is obviously no thread, no thread blocked by this future yet. Uh, and then we set the value to pending. So the complete Implementation is again quite same. We just read volatile, volatile semantics, how the current value and compare it if it's pending or not. And the value is, is, is differs. The first part is the same. Again, we check quickly if the future is complete or not, and then we return. But uh, if the future is not completed, we don't go through uh, any critical section, but we uh, try in a, in a loop to insert a new node which is representing a current thread into the list. So this is as I was talking about, this is the loop where I read the current value here, I construct a new value, and I try to compare and set the new head until it succeeds. After that, we will block this thread until the future is complete. When it's woken up, we just return the current value, as it was read here. And we also have to make sure that our node is, and its flag awake is set to true. And uh, how this works is that the fulfill method actually wakes up only the first thread in the list. And this thread, when it wakes up, it wakes up the next thread. So before it was that fulfill a method was waking up all the threads. This is chained together. So because of that, we here need to wake up the previous head, which was read here, which is the next node in the list. And the full implementation here avoids uh, the critical section by comparing and setting uh, the atomic value. So it checks that the value is still pending. If it is, it sets a new value and wake up the first uh, node in the, in the list of waiting threads. Otherwise, we know if the operation was not successful, then we can raise, a, raise an exception here that we are trying to fulfill it more than once. And this is just a helper how to wake up the threads. So first it checks that this, there was actually a node. It, if there wasn't, it just means that we are in, at the end of the list. And after that, there is a loop again, which just checks that the node or the thread was successfully evoked. And it does, it just breaks from the loop. Otherwise, it tries to wake up the thread. So 
So now we can see how this improves the times for the fulfill benchmarks. It's uh, better for on all of the implementations again because we've, we've eliminated the path through the criti critical section. Now we can look so at the final comparison of all of the implementations. And you can notice how JRuby plus stuff is actually quite fast. It's actually more than 15 times faster than MRI in this case for the last uh, implementation I just showed. So in conclusion, uh, if you need a concurrent tool, look first in concurrent RubyGem because there is uh, lots of implemented already. So it's probable that you find what you need there. Uh, otherwise, please let us know. We can uh, cooperate on uh, adding a new one or uh, we can add a new one for you if we have a time. Um, if you are writing new concurrent abstraction, try to use this layer because it gives you portability between all of the Ruby abstractions, uh, sorry, uh, implementations, and you will not also have to care about uh, uh, new versions and stuff like that because we will be obviously maintaining this. And uh, keep an eye on JRuby plus Truffle because I think we have, we can look forward to the performance it will bring to Ruby world. Uh, here are some links if you want to find out more about Concurrent Ruby or Truffle, or if you want to uh, follow some news, you can follow me on Twitter. And uh, that's it from me. Thank you for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, that's the meaning in uh, C, if I understand it correctly. Uh, sorry, the question was uh, what the volatile means in this uh, presentation. So uh, the volatile in C means that it's an external change, usually, it's, I, if I understand correctly, from some different hardware. Uh, but what I actually meant is volatile in a sense of Java. It just means that it's the guarantee of the visibility that you cannot get stale reads and stuff like that. And also, there is, uh, uh, you can use it for, uh, because when you write to a volatile variable, uh, then uh, when another thread reads the value, it's guaranteed that it co also sees all the changes, changes which led to the value which was written to the variable. The clo closure uh, mainly protects itself Sorry, the question was if I work with another languages uh, which are dealing with this differently. So, for example, Clojure uh, deals with this by making all of the values basically volatile, and there are just few special references which can hold uh, different values, and these are protected against this. Uh, what was the another language? Uh, Elixir. Elixir. Elixir is based on Erlang, and uh, Erlang, if I understand correctly, is has actors and all of the state in each actor is isolated from the other actors. And when there is a message going from one actor to another, it's actually copied. So you don't have to deal with this because you don't have really a share uh, objects per se. Okay, thank you again. If you want to talk to me later about this, please find me. <laughs>